All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Limitless MD. I'm your host, Vikram Ryan. Today, I have a really good friend, doctor, CMO, complete badass. He's a senior healthcare executive at Luminous Health. He's a chief medical officer. His name is Dr. Sunil Madan. What if you could reclaim hours of free time each week, create legacy building wealth, and devote more energy to your passion projects without giving up on your career as a life-saving MD? My name is Vikram Raya, functional cardiologist, high-performance coach, and real estate expert. And I'm here to give you the tools, strategies, and solutions you need to transform your life so you can unlock your limitless potential and achieve greatness, all the while freeing up your precious time. Welcome to Limitless MD. Let's dive in. Sunil, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast, Vikram. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, this guy is the real deal. He has been an ER physician, acclaimed, reputable, all in the DC, Virginia, Maryland area. He's taking care of multiple hospital systems. And now he ascended to the role of chief medical officer at Luminous Health, which used to be Doctors Community Hospital. And he's absolutely crushing it. He takes care of three acute care hospitals, 595 beds, over 9,000 team members. He is an entrepreneur at heart. He started urgent care clinics. He started venture capital companies, software companies. He's explored artificial intelligence and digital assistance. He's a father of three amazing kids, guys. And really, he's going to break down what it looks like for doctors to get into hospital leadership. So Sunil, man, what's your origin story? How did this all start, man? Why not be happy being an ER doc? Sure. I started um, one day with my mentor and leader who hired me, Dr. Mark Smith, who's head of, a, head of innovation for MedStar. I was working in an ER shift and was frustrated that the labs wouldn't turn around in a timely fashion. Next day, I went to Mark and I said, Mark, you know, I'm a little frustrated. I can't do my job. It's difficult to do it. The lab is a frustrating part of it. Um, Mark looked at me, sat down. He said, what do you think? What should we do? And I gave him some ideas, thoughts. He said, perfect. I want you to fix it. So not just point out a problem, but be the spark of change in terms of making improvement, making things better for everyone involved. That's how I started. That was a spark into what we call process improvement. How do you make businesses run better, operations run more efficiently? How do you make it a better place for a team? to, at the end of the day, be happy by, for being there and getting their work done. That's how it all started. And um, I know there's no direct path to becoming like a CMO or chief medical officer of a company or, I mean, or of a hospital uh, or even like an executive. There's no real clear-cut path. They didn't teach us this in medical school. Where did you learn um, that there was such a path for doctors? And two, how did you navigate that? Sure. I think one is by uh, you have a certain affinity. Uh, I had affinity to learn uh, the business, meaning how does the ER work? Uh, what are the nuts and bolts? Um, from there, you uh, will at times augment your education. My first entree was uh, a business certificate from John Hopkins School of Business, Cary School of Business. It was a one-year class, four classes. And one of the classes I took was called Leadership. And, and I was really, I thought, what kind of class is this? This is going to be boring. Um, and the first part, part of the class was a famous book there was, uh, that you see out there called Managers versus Leaders. And we read that and we had to do a self-assessment. Uh, are you a manager or a leader? So do you think about day-to-day -day, uh, what it is to run your practice? Or do you think like a leader? Like, how do I make change? How do I deliver the ultimate care for our patients? How do you think about the big picture rather than just yourself. And in writing that paper, I thought to myself, my God, I act like a manager at this point. I'm not a leader. And that was the moment of change for me. So furthering your education one, I would say getting a mentor that's done certain things that can help you out. One of my mentors was, I was on a board of a company that later well, was uh, the origins of healthcare.gov and was sold to United Healthcare. And in that was CEO of the president of the company, um, Bikram Bakshi. He is a Wharton business guy. And I used to listen to him, uh, give me some ideas about how things are going, just bounce ideas off of him. And one of the statements that stood out that he always said to me is that's all about execution. 
Mm, you can have a million that. ideas, but it's all about execution. And why do you think that's so important for doctors out there, uh, especially visionary doctors? Uh, I think uh, uh, many doctors are very, they're brilliant people, type A personalities. They do good. They know they work their entire life to uh, go to medical school, succeed in a residency, in a profession. But I think taking that mindset to a different level, sim similar to what you do in coaching the many of the great physicians that you work with, is how do you get them from stop being over analyzers to being visionaries to action oriented? to delivering, taking the limits away from uh, that they place on themselves and how do they get the next level of being the ultimate leader? I love that. So you said step one was further education, two, get the mentor, three, identify sort of the change you want to see and then start working toward it. And then obviously you got uh, you got that training done. How did you, and then you're, you had the insight, hmm, I'm not, I'm not a leader yet, the manager thing I've I've accomplished. How what's the transition that a doctor can take to go from a manager to becoming a leader? So I think one one is uh, you're given some real life experiences or challenges. So let's just say uh, your boss asks you to work on a committee in the hospital, and it's not part of your normal job. It's not something. It's something that's going to take extra effort. And you have to think beyond what your day-to-day -day duties are. You have to think bigger. So what can I do to be more helpful to the organization? What, what uh, type of benefits can I bring for my patients or my colleagues? And you take on a project, for example, that's not part of your normal. It's not part of your comfort zone even. And you take on this project and you try to deliver on it. Now, you may fail. That's okay. Uh, failing is part of the learning process. And that's where you get uh, acute knowledge of how you can affect change. And once you do uh, something positive to change the environment, uh, there will be a prob prob probable positive feedback you get from others. Um, you will be, hey, this is a guy you can go to if you want to get something done. He sees the bigger picture or she sees the bigger picture uh, in how to invest and make things better. So I'm a hospitalist. I have maybe five years of experience. I'm working in a mid-sized hospital system. And, you know, I've done some couple of projects, you know, but what's the next step in me becoming one day a CMO or chief medical officer of the hospital? I think one is understanding the business. So the hospital as a whole, you have to understand the different aspects of that business. So it's, it's what we call business knowledge. Okay, so... How does a uh, how does the radiology department operate? How does uh, uh, cardiology department operate? So it's not about in the field you're in. If I'm a GI doctor, I'm truly understanding what does a cardiologist need, what does the hospital need from me, what are the business aspects that make things uh, work. For example, more hospitals, most hospitals are non for profit. What does that really mean? Does that mean? They don't make any money. No, it means that they are profitable businesses that we invest in the business itself rather than to stockholders such as a for-profit company. So understanding the business of it, understanding what we call change management. How do you make uh, change, innovation? Finally, it's team, team-based care. How do you build diverse, effective teams that deliver the change? And the business knowledge also includes financial knowledge, you know, understanding the basics of finance, of how things work. We may understand how a billing works with professional services, but how does a facility billing work? What is a DRG payment, for example? Um, hospitals paid a lump sum based on a diagnosis, and how do you manage those resources effectively for that diagnosis? What do you say to the fact that some, some uh, doctors feel like, hey, you're gone to the other side. You're not with us anymore. You're not representing phys physicians. You're representing the hospital now. Uh, you know, you're always thinking that one of the largest assets of any company are the people, whether it's the nurses, the technicians, or the doctors. They are the they are the ones that make the business go. And I think doctors are part of it. So my personal uh, opinion is that physician leaders make some of the best leaders because they understand the provider side of it. When I mean providers, I mean APPs, nurses, the entire team. And they understand the pain points. When a, uh, a physician has a bad shift, there's an error even. What type of moral injury happens to that provider? The guilt they feel. 
the so it's not only understanding that it's a business in terms of I need to uh, take care of X many patients and make a profit, but it's understanding the human behind of it, the team behind of it. And it's the emotional side of it that's important. So I think physician leaders make some of the best leaders because they understand uh, uh, the entire team outside of the business itself. Yeah, that makes I think the empathy, what you're saying, uh, it really resonates with a lot of folks, the, the empathy, because you've been there, you've been done that, you were on the front lines with them, and now you're representing them in leadership so their voices are, are heard and, and their concerns are met, along with how all the other departments, and you're sort of like integrating all the departments together, you're weaving it into where it makes financial sense, it makes good clinical sense, and it overall helps population health. It's interesting. We're, I practice in the state of Maryland. State of Maryland is an innovation project for Medicare. Hospitals are paid for true population health. There's two parts to the waiver by Medicare. One is the hospitals are pay, uh, paid on a lump sum budget or capitation. So if you take care of, if you uh, take care of more patients, you're not paid more. You get capped. So you have to use efficient resources in managing those patients. Two, true population health, meaning if you have an uncontrolled diabetic that comes to ED, uh, you're responsible for that. It's your job to collaborate with the community to make sure the diabetes is controlled in the community, even though you're not directly responsible for it. And the interesting other part of the waiver, it's called the all-payer system, which is that every payer pays the same reimbursement to you. A Medicaid patient pay, pays the same as a commercial Blue Cross Blue Shield patient. So you're not treating one patient differently than another patient. So it's actually a true population health model. And is that is that trend going across the country or is it just in states like Maryland? Uh, Maryland, other states like New Hampshire, uh, other states are looking at this model, slightly different versions of this model, but are looking at this model. At the end of the day, it's to deliver value. And what do I mean value? Value is quality over cost. It's how do you deal with value? And it's the value to the consumer, the average human being, to the system as a whole, when we know that um, healthcare costs are upwards of 20% of GDP, which is unsustainable financially to be one fifth of your entire economy in healthcare. We have to have true innovation to disruption and change. And the people that are gonna change it are folks like you, me, and all of our colleagues. That's awesome. So, you know, as a CMO, uh, you have to interact with a lot of the hospital leadership. What are the t key people you interact with? Is it the CEO of the hospital? Is it the, some of the vice presidents? Who is part of the leadership team of a hospital for a lot of the folks who, who are not familiar with some of that hierarchy? So there you'll be an executive team. At the head of the executive team will usually be a president or a CEO. And then the executive team usually includes a chief nursing officer. That's your really your, your diet partner, your biggest diet partner. And then the other partner will be somebody like a chief operating officer. They're over usually support services like food and nutrition, EBS, which is a folks that keep the house clean and working. Um, and those three are going to be the core. Larger you get, there are more support vice presidents. You also work with vice presidents over physician services, for example. Uh, you'll collaborate with somebody in the foundation or vice presidents over raising money for a foundation you'll collaborate with all these people. And at the end of the day, you work for a board of directors. A board of directors hires either the president who hires in a team, and you're part of that team to run a hospital. At the end of the day, the board of directors had the fiduciary responsibility to deliver the right care for the patients in a financially responsible manner. You know, a lot of people say the CMOs are like, similar to coaches of like sports teams. When something goes wrong, they love to, uh, you know, replace the CMO because they feel like they did something, you know. Um, can you speak on that a little bit on, and, and I, I want to congratulate you on your tenureship as you've been, how long have you been a CMO? Uh, approaching about seven years. Oh my God, that's amazing. But yeah, uh, I've been in hospital systems where the CMO gets replaced almost every year. Uh, can you explain some of that dynamic and, and maybe what makes a good CMO and what makes a good CMO uh, have lasting power? Great. I think, uh, you know, num number one, um, I would say these jobs at the C-suite are high risk, high reward, uh, meaning that sometimes there's a change just to make a change. Uh, the board may elect to make a change to change the direction of the organization. 
at the end of the day, I think um, good skilled individuals who listen to their teams, who foster great teams and support them uh, are the ones who stay around. And at the end of the day, as you know, in order to uh, the leaders who, who in any profession are probably the uh, A team or performers to begin with, you're the best cardiologist, you're the best ER doctor, you provide high quality care, but you also are empathetic and support your teams. And those are the people who ascend with additional coaching, uh, knowledge, uh, mentorship to the next level. And I think the ones that uh, have a longer tenure continue to adapt and change and innovate. Uh, at the end of the day, that's going to be the way to survive and, and flourish. You know, uh, with the hospitals sort of cutting costs, you know, their reimbursements going down, their cost. Uh, I think we had a conversation where you're sharing with me that uh, labor costs for these hospitals is going up um, and then reimbursements is going down. Uh, and then they have to still manage. And so, and they're also looking to acquire groups and practices, perhaps with their consent, perhaps without their consent. Um, how, how do doctors navigate this dynamic of the hospital spectrum that's changing? And it's, it's, it seems like a, it's a never, it's, it's not stable. It's, it's, um, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, I think, you know, healthcare organizations are described as complex organizations in business. And what that means is there's always, uh, you're being pulled in 10 directions. It's very dynamic. There are many forces. It's not like making a widget uh, and producing a quick widget. It's very complex. Uh, there are many forces. There's always uncertainty. And I think you have periods of uncertainty always. So, for example, um, when I first came uh, to the Washington DC area, a few months, a few years later, we hit 9-11. Uh, and it seemed like the world was changing overnight. Uh, and then there was the anthrax scare. Then, you know, I came to this specific institution where we were getting ready to be acquired. Um, so there's always some degree of uncertainty and business challenges. I think you have to learn to embrace it um, and learn to have a discipline of how you approach it. And there's an old saying in the, in the in the world of quality, structure, process, outcomes. Meaning if you have the right structures and the right processes, they're reproducible, standardized, you will deliver the outcomes. I would actually add to that exact scenario, one other thing ahead of it is you have the right leader. If you have the right leader with the right structure, process, you will deliver the outcomes you desire. And you can throw anything at that machinery and you'll adapt and deliver. You know, you're talking about getting out of comfort zones. Um, how do you know you hang out with CEOs and CMOs quite a bit? How 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 are you noticing the good ones? What are they doing to get out of their comfort zones and 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 having this constantly learning environment, adapting environment, and like, you know, anticipating what's coming around the corner? For for example, uh, I think it's uh, I'll see networking, conversing uh, with the other uh, giants in the industry, learning from them learning from smart people like yourself when you meet uh, uh, to mentorship uh, coaching. Uh, for example, I, in the pandemic, I had signed up for an MBA right before the pandemic started and ended up completing my MBA during the pandemic. And one of the elements of the uh, MBA program, which I liked, was we had personalized coaching. It was one of the most difficult times in my life in the recent past, I can tell you, that going through a pandemic, uh, community challenges, personal challenges, and trying to do an MBA at the same time. Uh, um, there was a uh, coach I had during that episode that probably saved me. Uh, she was a wonderful uh, healthcare HR executive from GE, and she was my coach. So one of the elements I know that you provide uh, in supporting many of the physicians is a coaching element. So how do you guide them uh, and having a coach to help you navigate some of the challenges uh, is an excellent asset. Do you miss practicing or, and do you still practice or are you a full-time executive now? Uh, I've transitioned over the last two years to being full-time. Uh, up to that time, I do uh, still hold credentials and practice on a PRN basis with Kaiser Permanente. Also another great organization where I try to learn from other great organizations of how they deliver. So you, um, uh, I do miss it. Uh, I think you end up getting asked for advice all the time so you practice uh, not officially but unofficially at times. Mm -hmm. So I definitely enjoy the patient interaction. That's what makes us unique. 
that's what makes us makes it fun. Uh, but uh, I'm practicing majority administratively at this point. If tell me about um, there's doctors here who are interested in going into um, either industry, pharma, biotech, uh, or they want to do their own health startup, or they want to maybe go down the MBA CMO route. Uh, what advice do you have for these kind of guys? I think you know uh, first is sort of uh, under, uh, understand what you like or dislike. So what are your one as you you and I have talked. One of my interests has always been technology. I've always somehow in my path has cost with technology. So understand what you love, uh, then create a clear path or goals to get to it. Um, get help with folks such as yourself in terms of mentorship, uh, coaching. Uh, help you uh, decide which way to go, get additional knowledge or expertise to supplement that. Uh, but you can, there are many things you may be unaware of that you can do. Like you can advise Amazon, for example, be part of their team. You wouldn't know it till you explored it. So I think it's really understanding what you like or dislike, exploring some of those options with appropriate mentorship and guidance. Uh, and then you may try things and may like it or dislike it and trying other things and not quitting, keeping, keeping going at it. So, you know, there's the, with the rise of uh, private equity in, in the medical space, tell me what you're seeing on the front lines in different parts of the country or in, uh, in your region. Um, I, I think a lot of doctors would be curious to see that. And is this a trend or is this a sort of a new permanent kind of a strategy that we're seeing? Definitely in certain fields, we will see a lot of corporate practice of medicine and private equity investments. Uh, most commonly, we're seen as emergency medicine, anesthesia, now GI and orthopedics. And these are, you know, smart business uh, uh, groups and individuals who, uh, who know that there is a decent profit margin and they can come in and invest and grow these businesses. However, the way the business works is they come in, they grow it, and then they have a, uh, they sell the business in three to five years. So we're seeing a high penetration uh, penetration of private equity in, in medicine. However, we're seeing the downside of it too, meaning physicians who get into private equity, sell their, sell their business, and then lose the control that they enjoyed. Mm. The, yes, the autonomy. The, yes. So then they're like, oh my God, what did I do? Or they feel lost and they're like, what do I do now? What's my next step? I feel like uh, I'm not as satisfied with my day-to-day work. And then you see some things in the pandemic. We saw doctors being laid off. I've never seen that till the pandemic where there wasn't a business in a couple of the private equity shops actually laid off doctors, which was the first I've ever seen in my life. So yes, the financial aspects may seem lucrative, but you have to fully understand what you're getting into. And if you're okay with it, that's fine. Uh, but you do not want folks to blindly go into this thinking that that will solve all their issues. So, uh, you know, as we wrap up here, I want to definitely talk about the future of health care. But before I do that, I know there's so many doctors, you know, who listen to the podcast. They're very smart. They're very entrepreneurial. They're, they're very successful. You know, they make, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Maybe they're starting to get to the upper, you know, close to the million dollar mark. But they're looking for that next challenge. And whether that's being a CEO of a hospital, a CMO, starting their own, you know, pro, uh, uh, hospital leadership role. What, what, like, if I wanted to be the CEO of the hospital, what is like, what's my pathway if all I have is a medical degree? Like, can you walk me through a little bit more detail versus more um, cookie cutter information? I want to know, like, you know, in three to five years, if I want to be a CEO of a hospital, what do I need to do? Sure. I think learn the basics of leadership. So I think adding some education. Uh, such do I as need this, an MBA? Uh, I, I, ideally, it is one of those things that unfortunately is required. It's like you can't be a doctor without okay. an MD. Uh, I would say you need some kind of leadership training. It doesn't necessarily mean be an MBA person, a certificate, a leadership program, a CMO school. Okay. You need the basics of understanding the finances, change management, team leadership, business acumen to get to the next level. Would you recommend being the director of my department, like the director of medicine or the director of cardiology or director of surgery? Uh, that's a good step. Can you skip over? So for example, I was a vice chair of a very large tertiary hospital. I did not go to the chairman role. Instead, I got this role. 
Okay. So you can get other roles that would catapult you into a leadership role. It doesn't mean the only path is to be a chair of a department and then maybe associate CMO to CMO. That's not necessarily the only path. With appropriate guidance and support, you can uh, get to that role. So leadership role, uh, some type of certification or education that that talked about hospital leadership. Uh, MBA is helpful, but not necessary. And then yeah, how do you make that jump then? I mean, it seems such a like a big jump from physician to hospital leader. Uh, definitely. I think you, 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 such as even my story, I tried for this role for about uh, two years. Um, okay. it, interviewed in a couple of places. Uh, one place, uh, a couple of places to reject it. Even this specific job, I was initially, they said they're going to pause their search because they were going through some changes. They came back a one month later and said, you're the, you're the uh, candidate we want. We want, we would love for you to have you come on and then negotiating that. So, you know, whether it's uh, getting your CV ready to uh, networking, to trying for these roles, I think one of the paths that's uh, uh, available is you have to try for these things in order to get it. And then uh, do a lot of the hospitals prefer outside CMOs or inside CMOs? So uh, it depends. Um, uh, people looking for change would like to bring uh, people from the outside who have experienced other organizations. For example, coming to this organization, um, I had a experience for MedStar, a local 12 hospital non profit which was valued. They wanted that outside experience coming in. Um, at, at other times, they want somebody from the inside because they uh, they know the value and the values and the, uh, of that individual, how they operate, how they're collaborative, et cetera. So may choose to go from the inside and elevate somebody. That's awesome, man. Uh, congratulations on everything you've achieved um, and, and all of your future success. What's next for you, man? Looking at several things, I have to ascend in my path of leadership as well, uh, maybe to a larger organization, to a level of president, CEO, uh, also looking at uh, working with you collaborative to launch a CMO uh, uh, specialized program, helps leaders ascend to the next level of leadership within a limited time frame with a very specialized personal touch, high touch uh, way of education and coaching. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Okay, guys, uh, you heard the the pathway, the the challenges and the victories, and also the impact uh, a CMO can have on an organization. And I know we've talked about entrepreneurship, but this is almost what I call an entrepreneurship. You're an entrepreneur in an organization, and you're allowed to sort of flex your 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 intellectual curiosity. You're allowed to, you know optimize multiple departments, similar to multiple divisions of a company, it's just multiple divisions of an, a hospital. And you're really uh, the integrator. You're really integrating, you know, nursing and, and, and physicians. And you're also working on the finances and making sure you're profitable, um, even the, if the profits are reinvested as a not-for-profit. So it's such a dynamic role. It's something that if you really want to do it, you need to get in touch with this guy. So what's the best way for them to get in touch with you, Sunil? Right, so my e email uh, is uh, actually Sunil, S-U-N-I-L, period, I, period, M-A-D-A-N at gmail.com. Shoot me an email, um, contact you even. I will be happy to uh, help anyone, guide them um, to do become a leader in any of the fields related to healthcare. All right, guys, that will all be in the show notes below. Sunil, uh, Madan, MBA executive CMO. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Rick Herman. Uh, good luck to all the people listening. All right, guys, you heard it. Um, great episode. Make sure you share with some friends. And again, thank you again for supporting the channel. And guys, until next time, be phenomenal. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Limitless MD. If you found value from this episode, I encourage you to share this episode with a friend and let me know by leaving a review. For more information, make sure you check out the links in the show notes below or simply visit VikramRaya.com. So until next time, my friends, be phenomenal.